Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. It's a Therapy Thursday session. I have some thoughts and some answers on Trent Williams, Bruce Allen, and more. Receiver Stephen Sims joins me to discuss his improvement, and Chef Mel drops by and we give you a head start on some holiday meals. His deep fry turkey method is pretty good. You're going to want to buy a deep fryer after hearing this. But first, my conversation with Stephen Sims. And before I get into that, I wanted to talk to Sims, and we were only able to spend a few minutes, but I still wanted to play this for you because in the last few weeks, what you see on film is Stephen Sims constantly getting open. He's not always the primary guy, but he is getting open. And you see that more and more in the one on one situations. He's shaking guys and he's leaving them on the ground. I saw that against Carolina. You saw that last week um, in, in Green Bay at times. And I think the Redskins are also doing a better job of trying to get him the ball and creating situations to get him the ball. And I'll give you an example. Last week, there was a one play in which he motions to a stack formation against man coverage and he runs a crossing route. On the backside, on the backside, they have the tight end, Jeremy Sprinkle, running across the middle, but running, running starting across the middle and then turning up. And what that did is it created a lot of traffic for the corner covering Sims. So instead of being having being able to un, undercut Sprinkle, he has to go behind him. And that creates the opening for Sims to catch and run. It was like a 13 or 14 yard gain. But he, he had, I think, 12 of those yards came after the catch because of the space created. Then there were other times they would sneak him behind um, a mesh route concept where you have two crossers over the middle and he'd sneak behind there. So the linebackers widen, creates a gap in the middle for Sims. So they're doing a better job there. And that's why I wanted to talk to him. I think this is a guy who's going to be interesting in the future um, because I think a lot will depend on who the next coach is and how their passing game is. But he's a guy who's starting to show that he can get open and make some plays. So let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Steven Sims. You've been a lot, getting a lot more involved lately. What, what do you feel like? Obviously, they're going to give you a chance, but where do you feel that like you've improved to get those more chances? Uh, really just my preparation during the week, um, slowing the game down, mentally, the mental part of the game, and just just playing faster on Sundays. I feel like that's what it is. What do you notice? Because like every game now, I'm watching you get wide open, you're killing guys at the line. Where do you feel that because of you're you know, slowing down, for you, what are you able to do with that you weren't maybe to earlier this year? Uh, I guess I was just thinking more earlier this season, thinking rather than just just playing, reacting to what I see and just playing. And, and how, like, what do you see that helping you the most out there? Like, are you doing things now that you're just like, hey, that's pretty cool? Uh, nah, nothing really. Just noticing tips uh, and things like that that, that uh, the, dis- the defense may be disguised in a certain coverage, and, and I'm just getting tips through, uh, based off of the film that I'm watching uh, to, to know that they're in another coverage, that they're not disguising. So that's helping me play faster. So when they do rotate after the ball snap, it's no, it's no surprise to me. Are you, are you, you know, you've all, you've kind of had a career where you have to always constantly prove yourself and to show you about, is that, do you like that? Is that exhausting? What's that like? Nah, it's, it's always fun, uh, you know, being an underdog, being doubted, uh, it's, it's just, it's always been fun to me. I look at it as more fun than, than, than any uh, stress or hard work, you know, I just, it's fun to me, you know, uh, football is something I do, I play, I play, uh, I feel like I play at a very high level and, and throughout all my life I feel like I've been this way and I've just been doubted because of my size, so. It was, and it was like that coming out of high school too, were you surprised mm-hmm. that you didn't, because I mean, you had Kansas, you had a couple other smaller schools, were you surprised by that or just? I definitely was surprised based off of the numbers that I had, but you know, it was, that was, that's just what it was, you know, my situation landed me at Kansas and now here I am. Were you surprised after the draft because, again, you, know, you had the slower 40 time than you probably wanted at your pro day, then you didn't get drafted. Was it, Would you just kind of say to yourself, well, it's just another time where i got to go prove myself? Yeah, pretty much. That's how, how I looked at it. Uh, didn't my, my time wasn't what I wanted it to be, but I know I play faster on the field. So that's all I wanted to show was just give me get an opportunity to come show how I play in real life on the field when we actually got pads on and we're not doing drills. Where do you think you can go from here? Obviously, there's a lot of points in there, but where do you think you can go from here? 
the sky's the limit. Uh, I feel like I can, I can do anything. Uh, honestly, my talents, I feel like uh, I can be a, a, a great receiver in this league. I can be a great returner in this league, whatever whatever a team needs me to be. You, and again, I'm watching the last couple weeks, you're dusting guys at the line. <laughs> How much fun is that? Because you had like, I think it was against Carolina, you twisted the guy around. You know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. over the middle. Yeah. What's that like to go back and watch it? How much fun is that? No, that's definitely fun, you know, just seeing yourself compete against guys you know that they, these they consider better than you these guys first rounders and things like this guys that they said you couldn't play with and you know to see me doing that it's just it's just show you you know it just, it's just I guess it's a testament to my story last one too you, you a couple weeks ago you have a Deion Sanders high step mm -hmm. what there's a, there's a little bit there's a flash there so yeah. where, where does that I mean I know where it comes from it's Deion but why do you want to do that and you know was it, how fun was that uh, it was just it, it was it was it was very fun uh, doing that. Uh, you know, Deion, Deion's my one of he's actually my favorite football player ever. So you know, just to be in the Redskins uniform, performing like like at a high level like he used to, uh, and, and I really didn't have anything in my head. I just looked back and didn't see anyone. So I was like, hey, I'll start high stepping. Uh, that's something I used to do in little league too. They used to tell me, wait till you get to the NFL to do that. Wait till you get to the NFL. You know, in little league you can't really celebrate and taunt. So finally got to do it, it was just fun, it was it was hilarious. Cool, it must be a lot of fun for you right now because you're getting that extra time and showing a lot what you can do. It's gotta be fun for you to look at what you're doing. Well, definitely fun, definitely fun, enjoying it, loving it, cool. rookie year. All right, thanks appreciate man, appreciate it. it. No After this break, I'll be back with your Therapy Thursday questions. Obviously, there's a lot of talk on Bruce Allen and then a lot of questions about some ex-Redskins having a bigger role in the organization. I'm going to answer those questions next. Okay, now it's time for Therapy Thursday. A lot of questions, similar themes, playing off this theme. So let's get to it. A lot of questions here. BG Obsession wants to know when considering future coaching staffs and their offensive philosophies what kind of offense would best suit Dwayne Haskins skill set and which head coach might be the best fit to implement it well BGO I'm going to start with by not not by looking on the field but for the expectations that the coach sets and how they're able to coach him what is their method um, etc and I'd want someone to stay on him coach him hard but also be very um enthusiastic and, and and not so much just complimentary but somebody who's going to build up um, more than anything else I think he'd respond to all that I think there needs to be a high level of expectation for his approach if you want to keep this job this is what I expect you to do they need to be able to expand the playbook something they really haven't been able to do so far um, very still kind of early in the process but that's that's where it is so whatever coach is demanding is fine by me He's demanding and again not a teardown guy um, but definitely demanding. And I don't have a guy that I say, oh, this guy is perfect. I don't have one name in particular. I think the attributes of a guy like Eric Bieniemy, from what I've been told, would be good for an entire team. Keep in mind, too, that a head coach is not going to spend all of his time with the quarterback. The head coach sets a tone, but it's really the quarterback's coach and the offensive coordinator that is the key here. So whoever the head coach is, it's the expectation that trickles down, but they're not going to be the guy that's spending all their time with the quarterback. Um, I think I think there's still a lot to learn about some of these guys, the coaching candidates, before you say, oh, this guy is perfect. Um, I, you, you need to learn more about them. I don't like to just jump in there and say, oh, I read about this guy. I want to talk to people about those guys before I get to that point. Um, you know, I want to find out why they might be hard or why they're not. Um, and as for the style and all that, I did ask somebody about that here, what they feel he'd be best at in an ideal situation. And they, they pointed to the play pass quick game. They felt that Haskins could be very good in this area because of his size at the line, allowing him to see a lot, and they liked his compact release. So they felt like that would be a good fit. Um, from there, more play action and then driving the ball down the field. They have had to work with him on playing from under center so that way he and the offense is not predictable. And there has been some predictability at times with this. That's a big key here. And so right now I don't feel like they feel like they can implement everything because the, the emphasis has been on the run game. And then, you know, typically they're throwing in obvious throwing situations. So he's dropping in the gun where he's also comfortable, but they like to play pass quick game from under center. Um, anyways, on to hashtag fire Bruce Allen, hail to old DC. 
Could we believe that Trent Williams might be in a Redskins uniform and helmet next season if Fire Bruce Allen is successful? Okay, so I spoke with Trent last week about this and asked him this question. He really didn't have an answer, or at least he didn't give a definitive answer, but he didn't say no. There is no doubt he has a huge beef with Bruce Allen. We all know that. Williams told me, I can't say for certain it would be a no as of now. It would be, excuse me, as of now, it would be hard to see that as far as how far both sides were apart. It would be hard to see that. So he said, at the end of the day, I'm still on the Redskins roster. He, he stressed that he loves the locker room, loves the players here still. Um, you know, that, that matters. But what I would wonder is, what does Dan Snyder think? While Williams didn't trash him, he did trash the organization. It was not good for Snyder's team. And there are others in the front office who might not like having him back either because of all that. And because they felt, some people there definitely felt it was more about money than anything else. Um, I think this would be a definite wait and see situation. I still would, I would still lean toward not seeing him back, but who the heck knows? If they fired Allen, if a new coach or GM comes in and really wants to keep Williams, then I think it could get interesting. But then you still have an, an issue with medical staff, etc. All right, on to Owen at O Smith NFL. Alex is GM, D Hall is DC. Make any, makes sense? Good idea. Well, hi Owen. Um, I appreciate the thought, but no. Alex Smith has never been a GM and Hall has never been a defensive coach. Just being a smart player does not mean you're going to be a good coach or make a good GM right away. Um, I, unless you're paired with a coach who has a ton of power and it's really just a title only, kind of like out in San Francisco. Um, I'd rather see the, someone like D. Hall work his way into being a coordinator. I remember talking to a former player who was coaching in high school. and This was a smart player. Um, he thought because he was a former player, he could step right in and call plays. He quickly realized... No, he couldn't. It's a different ball game doing that. So he went back to being a position coach. If Hall wants to coach, he needs to step in as a DB coach and prove what he can do, something he's trying to do last year before they hired Ray Horton. Then you move your way up. Then you prove yourself. Then you realize you're on the headsets during the game. You're listening to the play calls and how quickly and how fast that stuff moves. It's different than just being a player who has strong opinions. And I love D. Hall. I think he's very smart, but I don't think you put him in there right away. No way. Um, as for Smith, I definitely believe he has executive leadership skills. I spoke to someone close to him recently, and he said that they had not talked at all about him pursuing any sort of a front office role. The focus now is still on his rehab and getting better with his leg. I think there's still a part of him that wants to see, can he make it back? Um, definitely a part of him. He's often seen with Dan Snyder. We know that. He's, he hangs out. He, that's where he watches the games. And now people are kind of making a huge leap, putting him into a GM consideration or, so, or something like that if that job opens. I think Alex is very smart. I also think he's a big-time family man, and I'm not sure that's the sort of commitment he would want right now. In addition to the fact, I think that's a huge, huge leap. You know, Again, this is provided he can no longer play. Um, Smith likes to attend his kids' sporting events, etc. He's very big with that. I don't know for sure he wouldn't want to that he wouldn't want to become a GM or in a front office in the future, but it's hard to see right now. It's just really hard to be the kind of family man that you'd want to be in these kind of jobs. It's just you're you're working a ton, and I think I would say that for all these guys, um, I could see him having some sort of a role here. I don't know what it is, and I don't know when that would be. <clears throat> okay, on to the next. J, uh, J, at JLev28, why is Bruce Allen still here? What is your confidence level he will either be fired or retire? Well, I don't see him retiring. If something happens where he does retire, I would say it was a forced one allowing him to leave on his terms or making it so if it would happen to be a case where Dan Snyder strips him of power, um, maybe from the football side, leaving Allen in a position where he'd rather not stay. I will say there's a lot, lot, lot more smoke around his being gone this year than ever before. I know what I mostly hear from others that they that you know some people again I'll just I'll just refer to there being a lot of smoke um, because I don't want sometimes what I say gets misconstrued or it gets turned into a report I'm not reporting anything here um, unless I hear this from an absolute high-ranking official you just don't know um, but I, I know you know some people say they're not sure that anything will happen others are pretty confident the other way we'll see. Um, I do, you know, but like I said, there's no reporting here. It's just that there's a lot of, lot of, lot of smoke. And I, you know, I think there's, it'll be interesting. The next couple of weeks will be very interesting um, because if something does happen, I would expect it to happen before the end of the season. I do believe the NFL wants the Redskins to get this mess cleaned up 
By mess, I mean the situation with the fan base. This isn't good for the league to have an iconic franchise fall into this sort of an abyss. And I think that's why you hear reports or you hear stuff about how Snyder is is looking at him a lot harder than he has in the past. And I've said this before, one of the things I was told, one of the um, thoughts was that there was so much going on at the end of last year that there, while, while everybody gets evaluated every year, but the evaluation maybe wasn't quite as deep because last year you had all the injuries. They were six and three. What everybody wants, to, anybody wants to think, this is the internal thinking. They're six and three, had all these injuries. Alex Smith gets hurt. You know, that kind of ruined the season. And then the whole focus was a lot of on, was on Brian LaFamina and that whole that whole business side um, situation. I think that took some of the pressure off of Allen. Well, the pressure is on right now. Um, at Corey Milliken wants, um, wants to know, should Geis's latest injury change the way they use him next year with AP presumably, presumably returning? What it should do is provide pause as far as expectations. He's never carried more than 10 times in an NFL game. We see the talent. That's obvious. But it's all about the Abel family in the NFL. Are you durable, reliable, available, etc.? Bryce Love will be back next year, and he's someone who will be intriguing depending on how his knee holds up. So what it should do is force the Redskins to seek other alternatives just in case. I mean, when you look at it right now, you'd have two running backs coming off knee injuries and another one who will be pushing 34, 35. Um, that's not the ideal situation. We don't know what's going to happen with Chris Thompson either. He is a free agent. But again, a lot of this depends on who is the next coach, who is in that, if, if Bruce Allen remains or he doesn't remain, I think that's all plays into this. At Johnny Guccione wants to know, what are the, this kind of plays off a similar question earlier. What are the chances that Snyder brings on former players to play big roles in the organization? Heard the rumors about D. Hall, Smith, Cooley, even Todd Bowles. Well, here's what I'd hope, and this is what you should hope. He brings on excellent people. Take a look at the best teams. They don't populate their front office with popular players from the past. It just seems like that everybody here wants guys from the past, and it just it, it doesn't work that way, man. That's not the best way to do things. You hire the best people. If these are the best people, that's fine. Um, I don't care if they're former players here or not. There seems to be a fascination with ex-Redskins taking premium roles. Guess what? They just had George Allen's son, and fans want him the hell out of here. They already have Doug Williams in the organization, and this has been a losing one. So... The answer isn't just hiring all these guys that fans know and think that they're smart because of what, how you hear them talk. And I agree, they're all very smart. I definitely agree with that. I think there's some, and I am not even dismissing any of them, but I think as a collective group, that just, it, it's, it's silly. I think there are some strong options out there. They could move Kyle Smith to GM if they don't want to lose him. And I believe my, my understanding is that he is signed beyond this, beyond next year. So that's good for them if he stays. Um, if they if the new guy keeps him, if there is a new guy. Um, they could try and bring in a guy like Morocco Brown who used to work here and knows the owner. But if Snyder views ties the organization as a primary focal point, this place is doomed. Hire them because they're good, not because they're your guys and, and you know them and you like them. And if any of them qualify, that's absolutely great. I can see, like I said, each one of those guys. Cooley, I think, would be a terrific tight ends coach right now. I think D. Hall is very smart. I think Alex Smith is very smart. I don't know Todd Bowles. Um, I, I've heard stuff about him, but I'm not going to address him now um, because he's in a different spot. He has earned his way into being a coach. That's what he's done. These other guys are still, they haven't coached at all in the NFL. Um, but to, so to put them in all big roles now, no. Bring on a couple for you know, maybe, maybe someone in there with a little bit more, okay. But I would want somebody in higher-ups who has a lot more experience in organizing what they need to do in these key roles. I can't stress enough. It's a different ball game being in the front office. You must grind. You work 100-hour weeks, especially in the lower levels um, in, in those front office jobs. There's a skill to knowing what to look for, how, um, developing relationships around the league, etc. I believe each of these guys are smart, could develop in certain roles, but to put them all in certain roles right now would be absolutely the wrong move. And again, that's not to say they couldn't have a role somewhere, but in all those key roles, no. Um, at John Casey 671 which coaches currently in the NFL can you see actually wanting to come to D.C. and work for this god-awful franchise owner? Well, I can see a few. I can't see a guy like David Shaw coming here. I feel pretty safe in saying that there's always the 1% chance that happens, but the percentage would be, would be that low right now. I've talked to many people about this situation, and, and more often than not, what I've heard is how Bruce and the current power structure would be an impediment. I mentioned that last week on the podcast as well. One agent told me it's a job for the daring or the desperate. 
Now, they could throw $10 million a year at some coach, make the offer so good they won't care about the power setup. But anyone in position to command that much money will do so because they're a strong and powerful coach. They would want power eventually, and it would be tough to win if, they don't, if, if there's a struggle there. They're also the sort of the coach that would command a princely sum anywhere. So my guess right now is they're probably going to get a second chance coach, maybe a first time guy. Um, I think the ideal guy in their minds, what I, by what I've heard, but this could all change depending on what happens with the front office, would be someone with previous head coaching experience. Wouldn't shock me to see a guy like Marvin Lewis at least get a look. He filled a few roles in Cincinnati, Cincinnati including the de facto as a de facto GM. Snyder knows him, which matters. He will have options, as will a guy like Ron Rivera. I see him elsewhere. Same for Mike McCarthy. You will hear all the big names thrown out, too. Just keep in mind that these coaches will have options. The Redskins must somehow make this job more attractive. It's, you know, right now, what you hear, what you'd hear internally is that, you know, this one of 32 jobs. Somebody's, they're going to get somebody, and they usually get somebody that they want. Um, they will pay. And I also believe that it's a lot easier to turn down a job that hasn't been offered to you in October, November than one that is in January. It allows you to go from making a million a year to making five, six, seven million a year. Um, if, it, if it's a first time guy, you'd have to put, I would think you'd put the enemy on the list. Um, I think, you know, he'll have options too, I believe. Um, I know some people really like him and I've heard some people who, who aren't as sold. So we'll see. Um, the feeling inside, again, is that Snyder hasn't had trouble attracting candidates over the years. He's more hands-off than ever, except for first-round quarterbacks. Um, I do think they have a, a, a solid young roster. I think there are questions at quarterback still, though, that will, that will um, give some coaches pause. Some, some of the veteran coaches who have more options will take pause because of that. Absolutely, they will. Um, now, some guys will convince themselves that they can win with whatever the Redskins have because they just want the job. They will tell they will tell them that yes, I believe in Dwayne Haskins. Whether or not they do, we'll find out over the next in the next year. But they 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 will say some people will say anything to get that job because there's so few of them. Um, I think really the best way to make this more attractive is to change the power structure. That is what I keep hearing over and over. All right. Last one, Redskin, at Redskins Cult, um, this might be controversial. Your top five must-watch Christmas films of all time. Oh, man. Okay. Let's start with Christmas Vacation. Then, because of um, nostalgia, Wonderful Life. Used to always watch that with my family growing up on Christmas Eve. We watch it with our kids now. Um, so it has a you know kind of special place. Miracle on 34th Street, the original one. I, I put that on there because that's what my wife and I wrap our, would wrap our gifts to when we're doing stuff for the kids. Um, so that's why that's on there. Um, Elf, that would be another one. And then this one might get me in trouble. It's probably Love Actually. I know I'm going to get ripped for that one. Can't help it. The heart what the heart wants what it wants. But again, that's something that we watch. You know, watch with my wife, whatever. And so enjoy that one. Coming close, the Santa Claus Home Alone. Um, I think that would be higher on the list. The last one would be higher on the list. But my one, my youngest son probably watched it 300 times growing up. I think we all kind of got burned out on that. I did not put Die Hard on there, um, and that's that. All right, that's it. That's it for the Therapy Thursday. Coming up next, it's Chef Mel. We talk some holiday meals. All right, back with Chef Mel, more food talk, probably maybe the most enjoyable part of the podcast anymore on Thursdays because it gives you something else to, to think about, to talk about, and something you can learn from, and that's where Chef Mel and comes And everybody in. eats. And everybody eats. Who doesn't like to eat? It's the holidays. <laughs> You're coming up in the holiday season, so I want to talk to Mel about some holiday recipes, some holiday food that he likes to make, and get your pen and pencil, or pen and, uh, I guess not pen and pencil, pen and paper ready. So mm -hmm. what do we got, Mel? What do you? What do? You, what's your holiday? What are your holiday go-to meals? My go-to is definitely got to do a fried turkey. Those are times like I like to definitely deep fried turkey. You get them like deep fried twice, you know, out of the holiday season, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, and I definitely want to do that. What, how do you do your your deep fried? I haven't done oh, the deep man, fried turkey. I, I inject that baby up, man, with <laughs> with some Cajun, and then I also um, season and everything. I really don't put too much seasoning. On a on the skin, you know, when I'm frying it, and reason why is that because it all of it fall off. Oh, so yeah. I don't really 
do all that until afterwards. So I season it afterwards. It like really good. Um, well, how do you and then when you season it afterward because it's coming out crispy, right? Okay, coming so out crispy. So how do you? So what do you do with it? How do you do the, apply the seasoning afterwards to make it stay? And how long do you keep so it? So once it come out the grease, that's when you want to do it because it's gonna stick. So right when it's still greasy, it's just like French fries. Okay, throw that thing in there just like that. Um, my other go to is um, definitely like I, I definitely take advantage of Brussels sprouts. Um, I'm a big fan of those, and I actually uh, use different cuts of meat, you know, with that. Um, that's one of my that's one of my go to. So when with the Brussels, because I love Brussels sprouts. Oh, I love them but when too. you do them right, not when you people think of that. It's like when you just you know, steam them, whatever. No, 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 nah. no. And and I think one of the keys to me is you got to get some saltiness in there. So ham or bacon with yes, it. Yes, bacon. You know, you got different different uh, pieces of meat that you could use with that. Definitely, I would I would go with bacon too. Bacon is like a really good. Because um, you want that saltiness to offset some of that bitterness. Really. And then use the balsamic vinaigrette to go with it too. Then. Yeah. You like the balsamic vinaigrette oh, balsamic. with it? Oh, man. Amazing. What, what else do you put in there when you're cooking it with it? Because I will do like, my wife will throw in sometimes like... Rosemary. Rosemary. Really? Yeah. Rosemary is my, like, it, it enhances the flavor. It's really good. Don't be taking it out of my notes now, John. Like I'm John Don <laughs> Rosemary because I want... I'm telling my wife because we make them now. So I want to know... I want to know. You can use speck. Now, you can use speck for, for the meat, you know, if you want to, you know, your speck is really good. Um, speck would go good with the um, with the Brussels sprouts. Now, also, I'm, 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 I'm a little different than everyone, traditional holiday stuff. I do, like, Jamaican oxtails. Um, Jamaican oxtails, it's, it's like, it's a beef. It's right. A, it's right a good beef. This. Yes, it's really it's good. It's really good. Um, like I said, I do seafood. I, I How do, do you cook the oxtails? Oh, two hours. Two hours, you know, two hours long. You let them things sit on the pot, crock so, pot. And almost, oh, just put them in the crock pot. You can put them in the crock pot. You can put them in your pot. And as long as you get them babies out and they tender, that's what you want. You want them kind of not falling off the bone, but damn near falling off the bone. Do you? How much seasoning should you put it? Because I know some you don't. Know, I've never layers. made the oxtail. It's layers on there. There's so many spices on there, you know, and people don't even know curry is in there too. There's a little bit of curry spice in there. But it's a, you know, you don't really identify it in there yet. But yeah, curry's inside of there. Um, there's a lot of spices, but you, um, it's layers. You sear it, and then you throw it into the pot, and then you let it, you know, because you gotta brown them before you put them in the pot. And you just a couple hours in just there. Just a couple hours in there. Yeah, I make you some, but they're really expensive too. Yeah, so, I know, but they're really good. I, I, I love. I, I have never made them though. Yeah, I have to charge you double if you get some of mine. <laughs> I, I'd probably pay double if I had some. Of so, them. what's your holiday dishes that you like, John? Huh? What you what, what you do I like? Well, I like. The, See, I haven't done the deep fried turkey. I, I like I've smoked the turkey. I've also smoked a ham too, mm-hmm. because and with the ham I've smoked it where you basically have to score it and then you know inject some stuff in there. But also then you're pouring some syrup on there too, so mm-hmm. it seeps in there. But you have to score because if you don't, just like a turkey, if you don't inject, then all you're getting is a turkey inside. You're not getting flavor. And so I think the same thing is true with the ham. To get the flavor inside there, you've got to inject. But then you can put like I think it's a, like a brown sugar and a and a syrup based. Um, rub on top of it glaze Mm -hmm. and um you know but like the hard part for me with the holidays is i'm typically busy so i don't have a chance to cook as much um as i normally would because like on thanksgiving the last couple years we've been working yeah and christmas day a lot of times it's you you know for some of the stuff you got to prepare so we'll but we will do like some sort of a prime rib on on a christmas oh oh, man i forgot about the prime rib you gotta say and get that going yeah but it's like really what you want like whatever you want uh, to make your holiday special or make it good, you know, just kind of like go with the winter, the winter dishes and and the holiday dishes, and and go from there, and just make it the best and enjoy your family and your time and stuff like that. Have fun. I think the deep fried is what I want to try, and I haven't done that man, yet. You gotta, and, man, you got to try that deep fry. Change, I know. Change, well, how change, often, change how long game. did it take you? Because I know some people try it, but does it take you a little bit of time to get used to doing it that way to get it right? Man, I throw that turkey in there, and, I, and, and 15, 20 minutes is ready to go, crispy. Mm. Is so, it, and, and that's what I love about what it. Do you, what now, the only thing I say is that is, is, is the temperature. Like, you got to just, like, make sure that the, temp, the heat, is, the, the temperature is right on there. Then also, you want to make sure that as it's cooking, that you're actually getting the whole turkey actually that's what I was gonna say, cause covered what? and cooked. Because, you know, you might have a leg that's still uncooked. Right. Or maybe undercooked a little bit. But, yeah, let's check this out. You can put it in the oven now. You don't have to. But I recommend if you undercook anything, throw it in the oven until, you know, you cut out the, the pieces and everything and you be right. good to go. And, and then you still got the same turkey that you put in the fryer. 
you know, and it's not going to change it or nothing like that. It's actually good. Yeah, and regardless, that, people put turkeys in the an oven anyway, right. but you don't have to put a deep fried turkey in the oven. And that's what I always start with the deep fried stuff because the my my the thing that if you get like go to a fried chicken place, if you don't do it right, it's going to be cold inside, yeah. and that's not a good thing. So that it, that's why I said I wonder if it takes a little bit of time to get used to getting the whole thing. Man, John, you got to do it. Put some seat, man. Put that Cajun seasoning on there, man. Put all your seasons on there. Put some lemon. Are you injecting oh with goodness. the Cajun? Oh, you got you got to inject it. So right, you, you inject I, it all over the breast. You, you what do you like whole, to inject with in that? You the, said Cajun. Uh, Tony, the Tony. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. I put that on there, man. That's good to go. But yeah, man, that's that's where it's at. Fried turkey is my holiday dish. All right. Well, see now we're giving you all you people listening. That's our gift to you. We're giving that stuff to you early, so now you got time to prepare and impress your family. Well, you know what, John? I want to know what the people like. I want to know what y'all guys go to holiday dishes are and how y'all kind of prepare them. Give me some of the All right, things. Well, and I'll, we'll ask that. I'll and tell I hope you what. it's not cranberries. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask them for the future, the next couple ones. We'll get some. We'll get some feedback from them what they like to cook or what questions they have. We'll try yeah. that next week. How's that? That sounds good. All right, Mel. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks, huh? Okay, that's it for this week. Thank you to Stephen Sims for joining me. Thank you to Chef Mel as always for stopping by and talking some holiday food. And thank you for your questions. And as always, for listening. Talk to you next time.